Hello, so if you aren't aware, I have a second YouTube channel now called The Museum of Everything Else, which basically covers like just things about the museum, sort of getting it ready, this, that, and the other, lots of random stuff. Basically, it's just a bit more free form kind of videos compared to look mum no computer stuff. So if you want to see more videos like these kind of videos, then definitely I recommend going and subscribing and checking out the videos over on the Museum of Everything Else. Links are below. Anyway, a little bit of a series that I've been doing over there since about January was covering old electronics magazines and the projects inside of them. I started in January covering a magazine called Everyday Electronics. It's this one right here. I have quite a pile of it and I've had a pile of Everyday Electronics for quite a while. I, I don't know how I found myself getting them. I think I found a few at a car boot sale and then I kept on looking on eBay for missing issues and stuff. So if you aren't aware, Everyday Electronics is easy to build projects for everyone. That's what Everyday Electronics is about. It's just Everyday electronics, you know, like a microprocessor at your door, and uh, what's this one? An electronic avometer and a tone booster. Look, you could be like Brian May, or is that Mr. Is that, oh, I don't know who that is. It's sort of a Townsend lookalike on the front, but they're also, oh, look at that. So there's a lot of guitar pedals in here, and I, I've got to be honest, I haven't actually built any of the guitar pedals yet, but it's only the beginning. That is, that is Pete Townsend, isn't it? I don't know, but look, look, so you've got the schematic there for a simple tone booster. If you've never built a tone booster before, it's actually a really easy and fun uh, schematic to build. In fact, that was, I think, the first ever guitar pedal I ever made was the copy of a Dallas tone booster, and it was awful, but amazing at the same time. It gave me so much excitement and satisfaction having built something that actually works even though it didn't work very well. These kind of magazines are just incredible. The amount of illustrations and stuff, I, d I dare to say like a sound a bit like, um, you know, oh it was better back then, but it really was. I mean look at that, you don't get that kind of stuff in magazines nowadays. It's absolutely beautiful and ah, oh, oh look, just look at that Ford Granada. Oh, is that a Granada? We ain't like it used to be, it ain't like it used to be. A blueprint for the Delta electric guitar. In fact, here is one that I have already covered in a video. This one has a auto call. It's got a, an accented metronome, which is a very strange device for a metronome. And funnily enough, I did a video on the Museum of Everything Else YouTube channel a couple of days ago about a specific me electronic mechanical metronome. This magazine was actually the first one I covered in a video. It's got the magnetome. It's basically a stylophone but instead of buttons or contacts and stuff you actually use reed relays which are little tiny relays when a magnet is put over these reed relays it makes the contact and actually plays the instrument the magnetone it's just absolutely genius but in the first few videos on everyday electronics I didn't actually build any of the schematics or anything and I, I probably should have and I'm probably going to revisit this. I know a few people are actually planning to build the magnetone. I'm not sure if any of them have yet. Like like a couple of patrons and stuff, they've said that they're going to try and build it, but I haven't seen any yet. Like turning that into a funky MIDI controller might be quite funny. But after looking through Everyday Electronics, I found a sort of advertisement for a slightly more advanced magazine that was under the same publishing company. And this was called Practical Electronics. Yeah, there was, there was two. There was Everyday Electronics, which was sort of more of a beginner, sort of more novel kind of approach. And then there's Practical Electronics with big, big, mean, meaty projects. And this is where projects actually stem over multiple magazines and multiple months because they are quite big projects. In in fact, in February of 1973, there is the Practical Electronics PE Sound Synthesizer project, and this spans over a few months, and it's quite an interesting design, and I'm, I'm inspecting it, and I'm going to be doing aspects of this in a series coming up. However, in the last couple of weeks, I have actually been covering this. In January 1978, it's a rhythm generator. It's basically a drum machine that you build by the plans in the magazines. So if we skip over to the drum machine, you can see this is the rhythm generator. I've been building this on the the last couple of videos over on the Museum of Everything Else YouTube channel with a plan of having it as an interactive display piece on the wall in the in the museum. It covers every aspect of the function of the drum machine so you can literally build it yourself. This part right here is the sequencer. It's built around an M253AA uh, chip and this has basically got uh, a bunch of sequence preset sequences in it and it's a, it's a preset drum machine so this is sort of how it was designed to be built i tried tracking down one of these chips and they're quite expensive nowadays and very hard to find but it's not the part of the drum machine that interested me most because i find that preset drum machines the biggest letdown is 
you know. So in the last two videos over on the Museum of Everything Else YouTube channel, I've been building the drum voices of it, and it actually, surprisingly, sounds really quite good. It sounds like this. The direct recording and sample pack is available over on my Patreon of these drum sounds. So if you want to use them in your songs and stuff, then go ahead, just jump over onto the Patreon and they're available there as well as loads of other sound packs. January 1978, I've been inspecting for the last few weeks because of the magazine. And there was also something else that really quite interested me in this magazine. I was flicking through it and I found this advertisement right here. It looks really quite strange. What it is, is it's a tester for logic chips. Funnily enough, in finding advertisements in numerous issues of Practical Electronics in 1978, I also found there was a DIY similar version of it available in January 1976. This actually tells you how to build one. <laughs> so this has all of the blueprints of building your own. It's basically just LEDs inside a big old box that reads what each of the leg of the chip are actually doing. Whilst this is really cool, it isn't quite as finessed as this actual manufactured item right here. So I had a look on the internet and I actually found one. Ooh. So are you ready for it? It's in this box right here. <laughs> Dun, 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 dun. Okay, so this isn't exactly the same. This is actually an LM2 instead of the LM1 that is on the video, but but look at it, it's actually the tester. So there wasn't actually any on eBay in the UK. I had to buy this from the US of A. And this uh, turned up a couple of weeks after I ordered it. It was $60, so no, it wasn't cheap, but I was really curious as to what the fudge was going on. So the conductive proms in the back of these are supposed to just sit bang on top of a logic chip like so and it'll read uh, what the fudge is going on with these status LEDs. Anyway let's turn it on and see if it actually works because yeah I haven't I haven't actually tested it yet. So let's see exactly what is going on here. So you may notice that it's got a big old chunky plastic box as well. Uh, I'm not sure whether the other one actually came with one of these. Uh, from the picture on the advertisement it sort of looks like it doesn't but maybe the wire from it has been edited out or something because it does make sense to have this uh, as it's got a selector knob that you can select between the different logic chip families how cool is that on the face of it it has dupont maint athens scratched onto it uh, dupont is a type of connector maint athens don't know, no idea. Maybe because somebody can fill us in in the comments on what that means. Maybe it is from uh, there. I'm not too sure, but uh, it's pretty funky. It's and the only other thing that is actually in the box, I'm just going to double check there's nothing underneath here. Oh no, yeah, there's really nothing else. Is the actual uh, kind of reader on the back of it is 16 LEDs uh, with 16 numbers of the pins. Uh, it says Logic Monitor Continental Specialities Corporation, New Haven, Con 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 Connecticut. I, I really, I don't think it's actually easily removable without breaking because you can see here it's actually one single molded item, and then there's two circuit boards on the inside which on inspection look a little bit more complicated than I was expecting. Maybe we will take this apart and have a quick peek on the inside, but let's give it a go first because I wouldn't want to break it before we even try it now. <laughs> so I've got this beefy mama of a converter. It's complete overkill, but it does the job and hopefully something's going to happen. Oh, so yeah, it's working. I think. This right here is a circuit that I built in the last Patreon live stream a couple of days ago and it is basically the building blocks of a sequencer, the sequencer that I'm building for the rhythm generator which is going to be the next instalment in, in a few days over on the Museum of Everything Else YouTube channel to make the uh, to finish off the rhythm generator machine and build it into an actual enclosure into this with this rather funky sequencer right here. But this has plenty of logic chips, which means we can use this to see whether it's actually working the way it should. Right, it's working the way it's supposed to be. It's really quite an interesting circuit and we'll be talking more about this in a future video. Anyway, this circuit right here is using a bunch of 4,000 logic IC chips. I, need, I just realized I need to do a little bit of rearranging because... 
it's not actually going to fit on top of it in the way that I've got it laid out because I've got wires going over the top of the circuit. Ah, uh, I've just realized what I've done. I forgot to connect the alligator clips. That's why they're always on. Oh, there we go. There we go. That is what this... So there's a 4013 dual flip-flop uh, IC chip underneath here. And this is telling you what all of the legs are doing. So how cool is that? So this is the power pin. Ground is down here. This is one flip-flop and this is another flip-flop. And as you can see, it's giving you the status of what is going on. And if you can see underneath it, it's not actually affecting the rest of the circuit. Press When I press reset to actually reset the pins, you can see the reset pins turn on. Uh, the inverted Q on the flip-flops are uh, on as well. That's because there's nothing going through. And when I send a bit in, send a few bits and it starts doing things. <laughs> That is incredible. I am going to be using this all the time. That is really quite fun. Right, next on the list, let's try this 4011 quad NAND gate. See what that's doing. Um, the one problem I'm finding with this is if you are reasonably scruffy like me with your breadboard and you have wires going over the top of the chips, it sort of makes it reasonably impossible to use. And there we go. We can write parts, we can remove parts, and it tells you what the uh, NAND gates are actually doing in the circuit. Next up, we're going to try it on this Commodore PET that a circuit bent a few months back. For, and for anybody who's worried, don't worry, the circuit bends are completely reversible. This can be put back completely to original, so don't worry, it was not a permanent thing. And it's actually got a Time of Software Mini PET on the inside, so it's not even the original motherboard in this right now. But this is really good to try because you can slow down the clock enough for us to see what all of the logic chips on the motherboard are actually doing. So... Let's give it a go. The link for the video on this modified Commodore PET is available below and there is also a sound pack over on my Patreon as well. The link is below. So if you want some sounds, then yeah, be my guest. Anyway, let's give this a looking. One of the limits of this is it can only uh, read statuses of chips that are up to 16 pins and also the narrower type of chips. You can't really get it around these larger ones. So let's start at the bottom, which is a 74HC145, which is a decoder driver. I'm not fully familiar of the full functioning of this motherboard, but there's flashy lights. So the clock speed is at the lowest I can have the clock speed on this circuit bent modification. Let's flick over to the next logic chip, which is a multiplexer. It, maybe if Dave of Time of Software is watching this video, he can explain which each of the chips are below and uh, we can have a good old look. Now the next one up is another 74HC138 multiplexer. Let's see what that one's doing. Next one we have is the 74HC00, which is a quad NAND gate. Are you ready for it? Let's push it on there. Oh, oh, we've got some... It's doing stuff. It would be rude not to plug in a 4017 decade counter chip and just see the fancy lights doing their flashy things, wouldn't it? Right, now let's give it a go. Yes! Oh, look at that! So all of them are lit, lit up right now in the correct ways. I'll speed up the clock going into the 4017. Ah, so awesome! Oh, this is so cool! I mean, it's exactly the same as wiring up LEDs on the breadboard, but I don't know, just uh, having a random dodgy design from the 1970s to do it with just makes it that just that oh so much sweeter. <laughs> so there's two of these circuits, one on either side. I'm really regretting it taking it apart already because I really don't know whether I'm going to get this back in. It's that awkwardly put together. So each side is based on four UA1458TCs, which I'm pretty sure are dual op amps. So yeah, each of these LEDs basically just uh, receive the signal through some buffers. It's, it's really that simple, but... How cool is that? Now I've got, now I've got to put this back together. Oh god damn. So that is the logic monitor. It's pretty damn cool, isn't it? It's it's really quite useful. Uh, it's a bit hard to actually get all of the contacts solid on there. Uh, there's been a couple of times where it doesn't quite make sense why it isn't working and you realize they're not actually touching the pins. All in all, it's a pretty cool and interesting device and I'm really pleased I managed to find one. Oh, that is so cool. Like I said, a lot of these projects uh, that you've seen in this video have been covered over on my Museum of Everything Else uh, channel. And uh, likewise, I've been building the secret 
sequencer, the breadboard and that stuff over on live streams and vlogs, uh, laying out all of the technicals over on my Patreon as well, which needless to say supports this kind of projects and stuff. So yeah, over on there is also the sound packs and stuff from this and yeah, loads of stuff. So if you want to support these kind of videos, then go and check it out over there. And yeah, I've been Look Mum No Computer. This is the LM2 uh, Logic Monitor. And yeah, and if you like what you see, don't forget to subscribe and uh, don't be scared to try it. Brrr.